What's up and welcome back to Nostalgia Pod, your weekly look at what's going on in pop culture. My name is Pat Sheehan. I'm here with my co-host Dave Martinson. Dave, it's like 90, 95 where I am. July, baseball's at the All-Star Game. And Childish Gambino dropped a two-song summer pack for us. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering, what's your song of the summer for 2018? Ah, uh, shit. Um, tough question. I, I saw a lot of people saying uh, Boot Up was a song of the summer mm. choice. And I just don't like that song enough. Yeah. I think I'm in the minority on that, but I saw that going around. Uh, it's a good question. I mean, I think right now, no one wants to say Drake, but yeah, I think know, it's Drake. He has the, the biggest tracks right now. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I, I mean, in my feelings, is the song of right now. So, for sure. Um, how long that last? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's ca it's capturing the moment kind of like Bodak Yellow did and uh, Black Beatles the year before. Um, the dance definitely helps a lot. Uh, you know, the, in my yeah, just went number one, his third number one of the year. <laughs> Ridiculous. Dude, he's a machine. So uh, yeah, it was it's interesting because usually I feel like there's like at least one or two, maybe three that you can look at and you're like, oh, these are like the songs everybody's listening to. But I think it's splintering a little bit more, and that's probably you know we, we've talked about the effect that streaming services have and just the fact that people have access to different music. They don't have to rely on the radio and being, mm -hmm. you know, having their, their taste catered to as much probably, uh, probably is influencing the lack of popularity in one specific song. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's kind of like last year, I guess. I think Bodak Yellow really started taking off around this time. Uh, Despacito is out by now. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, this year, yeah, if I like it by yeah. Cardi, that song was number one until Drake just, uh, dethrone on that but that, that song will be around all summer um yeah i mean i don't know how different it feels from last year but yeah i mean to your point anything can really take off in theory with streaming so it's uh still not over though you know we always forget that like you know july again july is when bodok took off so you gotta you gotta give it more time to really make an assertion but yeah i guess drake and drake and cardi are in the lead right now yeah, I mean, we're more than halfway done with July, so uh, it's crazy because I feel like sooner rather than later, we'll probably be talking about our, our fall preview, which just always feels crazy to be moving into like the last third or, or fourth of the year. Um, we got lots to talk about today, though. We got a couple albums. Uh, sorry to bother you. We're going to start off with some Emmy nominations. Before we jump into any of that, please subscribe on YouTube. Go to SoundCloud.com slash NostalgiaPod. Uh, give us any feedback on iTunes with a rating and review. Um, and also hit us up on Twitter at Nostalgia Pod. Uh, we just posted a little while ago about the first poster for Aquaman. What did you think of that poster? I actually thought it looked really good. You know? I mean, J Jason Momoa is awesome. Yeah. I w that's a movie that has a lot of uh, technical limit, uh, you know, hoops to jump through being underwater and whatnot. And James Wan even spoke about the challenge of that. So I mean, I'm really interested to see uh, what it looks like because I thought the Atlanta scenes in Justice League, which definitely didn't have as much time put into them as the Aquaman scenes will, I thought mm -hmm. those Atlanta scenes were just okay, mm -hmm. and that that like look you know can't fly when it's most of the movie. So I'm uh, looking forward to that. It's funny, San Diego Comic Con's this weekend, and that's probably the biggest pop we're gonna get from it is the Aqu first Aquaman trailer because mm -hmm. no Game of Thrones there, no Westworld there. Uh, Marvel's taking a year off. They're not there at all. Just letting Infinity War and Ant Man uh, take take them through the year. So, yeah, Aquaman will probably uh, take over the weekend due to lack of competition from Comic Con. So, we'll uh, we'll report back on that next week. It's a good moment for DC. Hopefully, they can uh, put out a good trailer, capture that moment. My favorite tweet related to the Aquaman poster was someone putting Vinny Chase's face on it, yep. which I just <laughs> found hilarious. Um, you know, you mentioned though. Westworld and Game of Thrones, both of those got a shit ton of Emmy nominations, dude. Like at 20, 21 for, um, oh no, sorry, 22 for Thrones, 21 for Westworld, Handmaid's Tale wasn't far behind. We talked about what we wanted to see, maybe mm -hmm. some predictions for the nominations last week. What stood out to you or what trends did you notice with the nominations that came out? Uh, yeah, so I think this is an interesting uh, field in which case there's a lot of like, you know, stuff stays the same with the Emmys and stuff kind of, you know, is new. And, you know, you can, anywhere you look with that, you can kind of pick up on that trend. Like, 
the big headline that people were throwing out was that Netflix was the most nominated network, 112 mm. overall, for uh, HBO with 108. HBO had been the most nominated network for uh, 18 years in a row up mm-hmm. until now. And everyone's like, oh, Netflix taking over and, you know, conveniently timing with that uh, HBO uh, new strategy that we talked about last week from uh, coming up from their uh, higher ups at Time Warner, right? Mm-hmm. And honestly, like, if you do like the math on this, like, Netflix puts out so much more content than HBO. We always say they're a qua- quantity over quality place. So I feel like in theory, they are bound to just get the nominations because obviously they have all that money. They're going to push and promote them their shows whether they're deserving or not. And then also, I think what the real difference is, is that uh, last year, HBO got a lot of noms from a, a limited series, Big Little Lies, right? Mm-hmm. This year, HBO did not have one of those. But who did? Netflix had Godless, the Western with yeah. Jeff Daniels. So uh, that's really the difference in a uh, in the th- in, in uh, you know the breakdown and on the other end of this uh, you know the the streamers uh, last year who became the first uh, uh, streamer to have the outstanding uh, best drama with Handmaid's Tale and you look now and Hulu's in second to last with only twenty seven nominations and Amazon's in last with twenty two hmm. so uh, Netflix's dominance over those two is still very uh, very obvious even the fact despite the fact that. Uh, Hulu got the you know, more prestigious award last year, so I, f- I find this interesting that you know people are trying to jump to all these conclusions with Netflix when I think it's really just a numbers game. Yeah, it's interesting too how how they can market these things because obviously everybody wants to say you know Emmy nominated series, I mean mm-hmm. Emmy nominated actor, um, but if you think about Hulu, you know who you said is way behind Netflix, they probably have two shows that are have a better chance to win than most of Netflix's shows. And you look at Marvelous Mrs. Maisel and Handmaid's Tale. I think that you know Rachel Brosnahan definitely has Maisel's on Prime, but same to your point. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, yeah. Sorry, I got confused there. Um, oh, you're right. But yeah, Handmaid's Tale. Um, uh, uh, Elizabeth Moss will probably have a chance at repeating. Mm-hmm. Um, has a shot at best drama again. Um, but yeah, Netflix is just going for that. That those numbers get those those nominations up. Yeah, just all that market share. Yeah. It's um, um, interesting. Something I saw a lot of people tweeting about was particularly the best comedy category um, and how stacked it is, uh, which I think is actually interesting for two reasons. One, I think it's just a really interesting race to look at um, what what shows are on there, um, what what didn't get on. Uh, like, for example, Good Place, I thought could have taken a spot over like Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt or even Curb, which I think just got yep. the... Uh, like generation um but what are your thoughts on the category yeah i agree and it's weird too because nbc was actually the third most nominated network they beat out of fx they had 78 so you would have thought good place would have had a, had a lot of that but yeah i mean i thought i think good place every critic would have picked it over kimmy schmidt and even i think kimmy schmidt fans aren't as high on the most recent season as they are if you know when the show first started sure but i mean yeah, I mean, whether you look at the acting categories or just overall best uh, outstanding comedy, uh, Atlanta, Barry, and Marvel's Mrs. Maisel, like, take your pick. You know, it's yeah. really, really tough. There's a case for all of those. So I think that's going to be fascinating to see what actually pulls ahead because Maisel did get the Golden Globe nominations, and we'll see if that actually carries through because obviously, you know, that was last fall. So, um, but yeah, definitely stacked and poor uh, Mike sure, but good place was not there. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, Ted Danson still got uh, best supporting nomination, and mm-hmm. I, I think he actually might have like a decent chance in that. I mean, he's a he's generational talent; he's been around forever. Everybody loves him, and he's great on the show. So I think he might actually have a, a okay chance at that one. Um, interesting for a show that you talked about. I didn't watch it. And I'm not. I'm planning on at some point getting caught up on a Twin Peaks. So it got, I think it was nine nominations yep. for a lot of those in writing and, and directing. Um, but it got snubbed in two major categories. First, I mean, obviously for just for best limited series, but then also Kyle McLaughlin, whose performance throughout the show was like heralded for being yeah. uh, a pretty challenging one, considering I think it, I saw one place that he had three parts to play. Yeah. Um, what do you make of them being left off? I mean, it doesn't really make sense. No, it doesn't make sense at all. It's freaking really stupid, if you ask me. <laughs> I mean, look what made it. Like, Genius, uh, yeah. Picasso made it. The second <laughs> I didn't season even know that of, was of Genius, yeah, the, no one liked it. And like, <laughs> but, like, and, and this is the kind of thing where, like, you know, 
this happens a lot with the Emmys where they just kind of vote for the same thing they're familiar with, right? Whether because they didn't, the voters hadn't seen the new stuff to give it a chance or that it's just stick with what they're familiar with. This is the first year Modern Family was not nominated for Best Comedy in the history of the show, yep. which is several seasons too late, but about time, right? right. So, and remember House of Cards and Homeland kept getting nominated well beyond their, uh, you know, peak prestige, right? Mm -hmm. And the fact that Genius, though, gets the, oh yeah, Genius, I like that last time. Yeah, fuck it. You know, Antonio Banderas, he's cool. Right. So I, <laughs> and like, but yeah, they, they, it's not like they didn't watch Twin Peaks. They got nine, you know, at least other, some some parts of the, the Emmy body anyway. But nine award. I mean, David Lynch got a few of those noms himself, including uh, that amazing black and white episode, which is the best episode of the season. So I just and Tom McLaughlin. Yeah, I mean, he he was great. He was really great. And yeah, limited series is often tough, but not this year isn't that bad. You know, I don't think it's it, w it was going to be that competitive and. I, I just it just sucks that like you know maybe because it came out last year it's a little old hat for the people you know how the calendar works but or maybe it's just Showtime's fault for not promoting it enough I don't know but it shouldn't have need to be promoted it was a lot of TV critics number one or top five show of the year you know so that's disappointing but at least it wasn't like totally totally overlooked you know the way like like Young Pope did Young Pope even get any nominations last year it got very few. Um, Try if it did, it was it didn't win anything for sure. Which a is... show like The Terror this year on AMC, which is really well liked, didn't really get anything at all. So, you know that, that does happen, and it's disappointing. I mean, I was happy to see uh, Killing Eve. Sandra O oh got nominated. She's actually the first Asian woman in a lead role in either drama or comedy to ever get nominated, which awesome. seems like w way too late, obviously. Oh, but yeah. it didn't get nominated for best drama, which a lot of people thought I had a great chance at, and neither did Mine Hunter from Netflix. And you know, this is the first year in several years that a freshman drama was not nominated i mean if you, you go back uh last year stranger things first season was nominated year before that mr robot mm -hmm. before that better call saul before that true detective before that house of cards that's back in 2013 all the way so this year they kind of just kept everything from last year and then they subbed out uh saul and house of cards for the return of game of thrones and added the americans but stranger things season two and westworld season two due to familiarity, due to Netflix and HBO pushing, they're still there. And frankly, I don't think any critic would pick either of those seasons over Killing Eve or Mindhunter. So, yeah, this stuff happens, but it's disappointing. Yeah, but shout out the Americans. I think, you know, they got, I think it was four big categories that they got nominated in. It was Outstanding yeah, Drama. Russell's there again. Yeah, Carrie Russell and Matt Reese, I think, both got a nomination mm -hmm. for their roles, yep. which is great. I mean, this is their, their last their last year doing it so um i hope i hope to see them get some some love at the awards coming up um you know go as we're talking about who got in who didn't game of thrones uh nominated amelia clark and kit harrington for outstanding uh, lead which right. is the first time they've done that and it didn't really work out for them neither one of them got nominated but all the lannisters did so thank god for that um <laughs> Well, I mean, what are your thoughts on that? Do you think do you think that's that's deserve it? Do you think they should have been on there? Uh, Tough yeah, I mean, yeah. I, th I mean, I think they're all great. I think we've kind of they've kind of been you know keeping Peter Dinklage in almost every year, if not all the years. I don't quite remember, but you know he's like the the peak of Tyrion as a character in terms of delivering mm -hmm. great lines and just letting Dinklage cook was a few seasons ago, right? So I guess probably just a film film familiarity thing you know the most popular mm -hmm. prestige show people already like voting for it they'll keep voting for it you know mm -hmm. um but yeah it was interesting to see that uh, the dominance didn't uh totally take over i mean even the drama stuff i'm really curious to see how it plays out because thrones is back this year after not being nominated last year due to the, when the season took place and will handmaid's tale win again i know uh people are definitely down the end of handmaid's tale season two and I mean, could you ever see Westworld season two or Stranger Things season two winning it? Could This Is Us win it? I don't think so. And will they give it to the Americans now of all times for the final season? So like, I really don't know what the front runner is for the drama. And it even permeates down to the actors. So. Yeah, it's tough. It's, I'm looking through the uh, lead actor in a drama series. I mean, Jason Bateman, Matt Reese, Sterling K. Brown, uh, Milo from This Is Us, I can't say his last name, Ed Harris. And and yeah, and Jeffrey Wright. I mean... I feel like Kit Harrington could have snuck in over one of those people. Like, you know, take Ed Harris out of there or take Milo. I mean, I feel like either Milo or Sterling K. Brown could have been supporting actors the way that. Didn't defined. Milo die? 
already? Yeah, and he's also in flashbacks. I mean, half the show is flashbacks, but oh, I see. Um, I mean, it's it's interesting. So, uh, and Jason Bateman for Ozark, I also was surprised. But I know that that show got a lot of love when it first came out. Also, an older show. So, you know, seeing something like Twin yeah, Peaks not not get nominated, but Ozark, Jason Bateman pulls the nomination. It's really interesting. Another curious thing: Ozark got five nominations, two of which were for directing. It got two different directing nominations, which is the same as the Americans. That just seems off to me. You know. Yeah. Netflix, uh, Netflix, uh, flexing their muscles with uh, those nominations. There should have done it for Mine Hunter, though. You know, <laughs> a couple you other know, other notes I made here that I just wanted to kind of shout out things I was either excited for or might be interesting to look look at as it approaches. Keenan Thompson for SNL. I mean, SNL got like I think four or five. Edie Bryant, um, Kate McKinnon also got another one. But Keenan Thompson, his 15th season on SNL, and he finally gets a nomination. That's pretty awesome. I'm guessing that's probably for his his role as a I don't know, Trebek in, in Black Jeopardy, which is a <laughs> pretty good running bit for them. Yeah, I'm not um, sure what episode it was. <laughs> I, I mean, they did it a lot, which is probably why. Um, John Legend has a chance at uh, securing an EGOT, which is pretty interesting. He got an Emmy nomination for Jesus yeah, Christ for, Superstar. I feel like no one ever talked about him as like in play EGOT, you know? No. So, sh- shout out John Legend, former good music artist. Um, Allison Brie got snubbed for best actress in a comedy. Um, again, tough category, um, mm. but yeah, I thought she would definitely get in there. Um, the last thing, Teddy Perkins got five nominations. That episode mm-hmm. got five nominations. So, I mean, if you, if for any reason you've been like, oh, I'm not so sure about Atlanta, which at this point, I don't really know what else I could say to sell you yeah. on it. Go back and listen or to you. reviews. Yeah, or if you gave up on it for some reason, go back. Go back watch, and watch, watch Teddy Perkins. Perkins. It's definitely uh, one of the standouts of the year. Something we'll be talking about. Any last thoughts for you? Anything you wanted to highlight? Uh, no, I think, uh, you know, overall, uh, I was more happy than I was mad, you know? Yeah. Any things I was mad about, it wasn't like total overlooking. Like, I was pretty sure, certain that. Mr. Robot wasn't getting there this time, and Mindhunter probably didn't have much hope. So that doesn't really surprise me, you know. Uh, and shout out to American Vandal, got a Reading nomination. Yeah, it is what it is. I I, I hope it, <laughs> I hope it, people talk about it a little bit more and go back and watch it. It does have a season two coming out, which I'm being, I'm interested to see how that goes. Soon. Yeah, no Bojack Horseman again. Bojack yeah, heads hate that. No, no love. <laughs> I mean, you'd think it would make it in there at some point. Netflix right? needs to help. They yeah. have the push. For sure. Uh, why don't we move on to some music, though? Uh, let's start with this uh, this band, Years and Years, which you you hit me up uh, before the weekend and said, oh, they just dropped this album. I'm getting a lot of love. Let's check it out. Uh, head, uh, headliner or uh, led by Ali Alexander, who's this mm-hmm. TV film music star. He's right around our age. Um, also uh, a big figure in the gay world right now that he mm-hmm. is like this icon for for that world um he leads this band who had you know their first album communion came out three years ago uh listening to it the main thing i took away from it was a very consistent pop sound and you know a lot of like like tropical like house you know in it, in it just very like it was good sure. all the way through nothing really stood out i know that you had a few songs that you liked from it the second album palo santo it's really interesting because I felt like it went more up and down than than the first one with some some much higher highs for me and, and a lot more lows. Um, what's your what's your feeling around years and years as a band and, and their their work so far? Yeah, I think the thing that stands out to me through these two records in three years is that the sound really did change for the sophomore album. That's usually not the case for a any artist that has a successful first album that's gets some love and gets some popularity, you know, Mm -hmm. but I mean, to your point at the highs and the lows, I think the second half of Palo Santo, uh, definitely is more the low end, but Mm -hmm. they do kind of, you know, trade a bunch of things off. Like it's not always synth pop. I think the reason they're classified as synth pop band is because the writing is definitely pop music, you know? Oh yeah. Yeah. And you know, it's electronic sounding, but Mm -hmm. I think, you know that electronic sound is much more diverse this time whereas the first one it was almost like like you said like, like like a tropical house vibe it was more um consistent in that regard but you know i think when they when years and years has a song that works well like i think on on uh, this new record uh, karma and all for you in particular i think they're just you know there's incredibly catchy songs and 
you know, it's just just good pop writing. And I think Greg Kirsten was actually involved on this uh, second record, which would make sense. That that guy's got his hands all over everything. It feels like every time we we look to see who produce a like a pop album, he's somehow involved <laughs> in it. Um, yeah, it, I think you kind of summed up the album well. Like the first half is really inventive or at least different from their their first one i don't know if, if they, they're trying anything super new but there's a lot to like you know a song like uh, hallelujah which maybe the songwriting on that isn't necessarily going to blow you away just the way that that it builds and the way that it like catches you through like into the middle of the song right to the end where it kind of stops just at the right time i think the energy in that is infectious uh sanctify and rendezvous were probably the other songs that stood out to me um all off the first half um, I feel like when they try to go slower and 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 bring yeah. the mood down a bit, they they kind of fall short. So uh, it's gonna be interesting to see how they evolve. And it seems like this Ali Alexander guy is someone to really keep an eye on moving forward. I'm, I'm excited that we we tapped into this because I feel like he's gonna be a, a big player moving forward in the pop culture world. Yeah, he just gave a recent interview. I believe it was with Billboard, and he was just talking about. Um, you know, like underlying like homophobia in the industry. And he's like, yeah, I mean, obviously now they all, the execs all say good things and you have Sam Smith to look at a successful openly gay artist, you know? Mm -hmm. And at the same point, he's like, yeah, but also we'll hear people, you know, you used to hear like, uh, oh, that's too far or that'll, um, that'll turn people off. You know, it's like a roundabout way of saying like, that's too gay. Don't do it that way, you know? Yeah. So the fact that he's just pushing out about that and just kind of becoming like this, you know, gay icon in a sense uh, is cool to see. And he's definitely a personality. I don't think he's like his voice is, you know, fantastic or anything, but I do like, I think his vocal register does move a little bit, you know, and when they're at their strengths, when it's up tempo, you know, I think he can really ride that beat and just, you know, make, uh, you know, sing good pop songs. So yeah, I agree with you. I'm excited to see where they go next. I believe they have a tour coming up and, you know, they're, they're a big uh, UK act, yeah. but we'll see how, if, or if they really permeate over here, you know, mm -hmm. I would I would love to see their next album be produced by like Disclosure or some or like sure. Jamie XX or someone like that to really yeah. kind of push their sound to like that next level. I feel like that'd be a great lane for them. Um, all right. So your guy Wiz Khalifa here. I'm calling him your guy because I was not going <laughs> to listen to this record, but uh, I felt like. I felt like, OK, I'll give Rolly Papers to a chance. I know Dave probably is going to listen to it. He'll like it. I opened and it was 25 songs, man. 90 fucking minutes. <sighs> oh, I mean, so so my, my relationship to Wiz is, uh, I mean, he's like the, the new Snoop Dogg, I guess. That's like the lane he's trying to fill. He, I think he does an okay job. He's a likable enough mm -hmm. rapper. I don't find him to be anyone that really moves the needle in terms of like, wow, this is going to blow me away or I'm going to like, you know, be listening to this forever. But he's solid. And I feel like that's kind of what Rolling Papers 2 is. Yeah. Loaded. Yep. But it's it's solid. You know, there's there's enough there to like, enough there to throw away. Um, you know, I think he had some some nice features on this and he tried a couple of things. Um I was surprised this was his first solo album in four years. Yeah. Which, Since uh August twenty fourteen was Black Hollywood. That's the album where uh Weedem Boys is from. And like he's had a bunch of mixtapes and you know, like a collab project with Juicy J, and then he had a Khalifa, which was like a compilation album, really just a, a mixtape came out in early 2016. And then it's called an album for like, for like label reasons, you know, whatever, mm -hmm. to satisfy a contract. But yeah, I know it's been a while for him to have a proper release. It's his sixth album, fourth major label album, you know, and you know, I, I've kind of been lukewarm on Wiz for a while now just because, you know, for someone with such a high profile, I mean, he really blew up you know, or fall of 2010 with black and yellow. Right. Yep. And then that led up to the first rolling papers, which is uh, his first major label album, his first album for most people that ever heard of him. And it wasn't quite what people expected, but it also had a bunch of other hits like no sleep. And, you know, he has these massive songs. I mean, we've said it before, but see you again with Charlie Puth, the second yeah. most viewed video on all of YouTube, 3.6 billion views. Like, and again, that's probably more of a label creation for the Fast and Furious soundtrack, but still credited as a Wiz song, you know? And he has all these songs and he does all these big summer tours. He's on one right now. And despite the fact that he's never brought up as one of the best MCs in the game, no one, no one ever thinks that. Even Wiz fans don't bring <laughs> him up like that, you know? Despite yeah. the commercial success and relative longevity. And 
you know, in a sense, he's kind of like a more, he's kind of like Big Sean, I guess, where it's just a product of diminishing returns. Yeah. But I mean, and he's, and because of that, the 25 track bloated 90 minute game, those streams album mm-hmm. is a bad fit for Wiz because you know what's going to happen. A lot of filler, a lot of repetitiveness yeah. stuff we didn't need to hear. We've heard a version of that song 10 times already from him, you know? Mm-hmm. And, but to your point, I think there's some good features on here. And I think when he does do tr- try things like, Heck, I think the first track on the whole album, which you know, it might be hard to remember at this point, but Hot Now, yep. I think is actually really cool. It kind of reminded me of Weedem Boys because when he gets more melodic and less just trappy, it's kind of fun. You know, mm-hmm. and I think um at Real Rich, which I believe was the second single, I don't like the Gucci feature on that. I thought Gucci kind of phoned in, but I think Wiz, because it's a little more melodic, like a singy rap, I thought it was really cool. You know, I, I like that from Wiz, especially now. And then there's other songs that just, you know, they go in one ear and out the other. Yeah. Uh, my favorite song still probably Hope Was Romantic with Sway Lee. Hmm. Uh, first song I heard from the album. And I think it's probably one of the better Sway uh, performances of the year, better than a lot of Swaycation. But again, that's more of Sway's track than Wiz's, to be honest. Exactly. I mean, I, yeah. yeah. To, to kind of jump off the, the Hopeless Romantic, I actually went back to Swaycation and was like, is this song actually from that album? Because I it sounded just like it could have been. Um, and I thought Sway was great on it, but yeah, I wouldn't really give that, that song to Wiz, even though it's on this album. You know, I thought Rolling Papers 2, the title track, was was pretty good, and it, it leads nice nicely into Mr. Williams, which I thought was like a change-up in sound for him that was a little bit airier, and he tried some stuff, which I thought was interesting. Gin and Drugs, which, I mean, if you want to... Yeah. Be the Snoop Dogg of our generation. I guess ripping off gin and juice right there is a good <laughs> way to do it. Um, and, I, you know, Snoop Dogg on Penthouse, I also thought was nice. Um, I, it, it was an enjoyable song for me. I, It's funny because I, the Gucci Man thing, I was excited to hear him because I was like, oh, maybe this will infuse a little bit of energy. And like you said, he really phoned it in. Um, it didn't even fit the vibe on Wiz's no. portion of the song either. It was just like copy paste gucci feature from the email like that's all it was yeah and you know you mentioned it, it it's a lot of filler i i ended up looking halfway through and i was like oh it's almost this has to be almost over and it, not even close it was, <laughs> yeah, it was rough. 10 more songs um <laughs> you know it's interesting we talked about this a little bit last week drake dropped this this bloated double album then we got 25 songs from wiz dilla juxtaposition is these much more shortened almost EP length albums. What do you think is the actual trend going to be here? Do you think people are going to move towards the shorter or towards those big lots of song albums? It's, it's a great question. I think the trend is to make the long album because it's more mm-hmm. financially uh, beneficial to you. Yeah. Uh, especially when you're a big artist, when you're already going to get a lot of attention. Um, yeah. I, until we actually see any evidence of, I think the short seven track album is just going to be Kanye's idea. Is anyone else going to do that? You know, like when, when we get the, I mean, little skies is featured on here. He's on Wiz's tour. When we get mm-hmm. the little skies debut album. That shit ain't going to be seven tracks. Right. He needs, he needs to get that paper still. Like, yeah. So, you know, I just, <sighs> I, I think too long is probably going to be more common than too short, unfortunately. And you know, you know, it's funny. Seven tracks and twenty-five tracks. What's a happy medium? I don't know. Fourteen, a normal album length. Mm-hmm. You know, right? So, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I don't know if we're gonna get much resolution anytime soon. Yeah, it's, it, until they can really figure out the the right way to calculate the streaming numbers, it's they're gonna go more towards the longer ones, unfortunately. Which I I would prefer them to do like nine tracks. Like if somehow you can like rig it so people are doing nine tracks, I feel like that's the right length, but. And that's the thing, like the the billboard changes that we mentioned, you know, a few weeks ago when they or over a month ago now when they unveiled them and recalculate uh, how the charge get affected. That's in effect now. Drake's first Scorpion week was the first week for that, but the charts are changed that way. But I mean, having a lot of tr- tracks still means there's more tracks to get played and get you paid. You know, right. that hasn't changed. So there's still more incentive. There's still more incentive to have a, a long album than there you know, is to have a short album, you know, even if the charts are not as benefited by it as they were a few weeks ago. So, uh, so we'll, we'll, we'll see. Uh, what do we got look, look to look forward to music next week? Anything big? The internet hive mind uh, the album. That'll be a good one. Looking forward to that. Uh, something I've been looking forward to, uh, I guess a movie made by a rapper boots, Riley, sorry to bother you starring Lakeith Stanfield, Tessa Thompson, 
uh, Steven Yoon, which I mean, mm-hmm. shout out Glenn. Great for fucking look for him. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, and also great look for Boots Riley. His debut as a right, you know, debut movie writing, directing. Uh, I thought he he killed it. You know, um, it's it's not quite, I guess, uh, Jordan Peele level. Although people have been comparing this to Get Out. There's a uh, lot of a lot of comparisons to Get Out and Boots Riley's debut compared to Jordan Peele's debut. There's a lot of similarities for sure. Um, but definitely up there. Uh, when did you see this movie and what was your reaction leaving it? Yeah, I saw it was last Friday. Uh, mm-hmm. Second weekend of release. I mean, the first weekend was, I think, just New York and LA, but only a handful of theaters. And it's still not really that wide yet, but it's making really good business at all the theaters, which is great to see uh, for a you know, non blockbuster film. But, you know, I fucking love this movie. Uh, I thought it was incredibly unique, incredibly engaging. Mm-hmm. Uh, and yeah, and just freaking original and entertaining, serious and funny. You know, it's got everything. And of course, great actors that we already like. So to not spoil anything, because I know that we'll get into the spoilers because they're they're out there. But uh, yeah. this is a movie that should not be skipped. Mm-hmm. And it's going to be in a big theater near most people. So take advantage of that. And you want to support movies like this when they come out because, uh, you know, this is so unique and such a, you know, just a told original creation from Boots Riley. He wrote the movie, I think, 2011, 2012 time. Mm-hmm. So he finally got it made with great talent and you got to uh, support that when it happens. Yeah, he has a lot to say. I mean, if, if you know anything about his uh, funk rap uh, group, The Coup, uh, mm-hmm. The Coop, I, I don't know exactly if it's The Coup or The Coop. Um, but yeah, they, it's a political group. They have a lot to say. They have, you know, they try to get a lot of points across in their music, which I think is is great. And this movie touches on a lot of things. I mean, just to give like the broad overview, touched on capitalism, uh, racism, uh, social, uh, classism, and socialism. Mm-hmm. There's a lot there to look at. And I, it, I started off the movie. I forgot to pay uh, for my parking, so I started off, uh, and I was like, "Oh fuck, I'm gonna get a ticket." And like. I was just thinking about that the whole time when this movie started. And I was like, I'm not even going to be able to enjoy this movie now because of this. Like, God damn it. Like immediately pulled me in. It was like super engaging. I've totally forgot about it, which I, I think is a great compliment to the movie that like something that was causing me that, that much stress beforehand. I was able to just totally take that away. Um, I left feeling just like trying to figure out like, what was this movie really trying to say? And I think it's hard to really summarize it and, and, and explain it to, you know, someone that hasn't seen it because it's trying to say so much yeah i I think it's multiple messages not one you know Mm -hmm. cohesive message or anything exactly um and but i thought it was great and you know to to your point a lot of people we liked and i already mentioned the the, probably the three headliners but army hammer our our guy from uh (laughs) call me by your name last year just most army hammer he can be throwing fucking fastballs from end of act two on (laughs) he, he was like born to play that role like yeah, for sure. Winklevoss twins on on cocaine, uh, and that also. I mean, even just like like the voice work, like Patton Oswalt and David Cross were great. Uh, yeah. Lily James also was good for the little bit that she was, you know, uh, voice acting in it. And I didn't even know Forrest Whitaker was uh, one of the the people you see at the end. Uh, yeah, I, I, I didn't know that either until I looked it up. Crazy, crazy. Um, all right, we're probably going to get into spoilers here in a second. So if for some reason you're, still, you're listening or checking this out and you don't want to have this spoiled for you, uh, come back to it after you yeah. see the movie. Uh, we'll, we'll be those going. time codes below. So come yeah. back. Check it out. All right. So, I mean, it, this is a probably a dystopian satire to um, the, like, the most, exa- like, biggest example it can be. Um, but I thought that that the thing I, I took away from this movie the most is Boots Riley has a great eye for shooting. And I had moments where I was like, oh, that reminds me of David Lynch or, oh, that reminds me mm-hmm. of Sam Eshmael from Mr. Robot. Sure. A lot yeah. of vibes in like the color work and like the way that, that he would frame things uh, yeah. or like the way he would use close ups. Uh, and I think especially like the, the party scene at Steve Loft's house you know mm-hmm. with with cash and and uh, yeah. you know looky Sayfield army hammer getting to do a lot there i thought there was like just a ton of really beautifully shot things juxtaposed with detroit's uh art display yeah, um but sure. what's it out to you most about boots riley's yeah. work here yeah i mean to that point uh 
61 locations for the film in a 28 day shoot. Really ambitious. <sighs> and also on yeah. top of that, you, when you watch it, they change costumes a lot, which yeah. is um, extra challenging for the director because it makes the edit harder if you want to re- remove, se- p- put scenes around, you know? And like Detroit's makeup changes a lot mm-hmm. throughout it. So it's just like they didn't hold anything back with making the film, which I thought was uh, incredibly admirable because again, he's a rookie filmmaker. Mm-hmm. And, uh, but yeah, I think the way, um, the way it moves from scene to scene is just, it's like really like kinetic. Like it's almost like really action. It's not action movies, mm-hmm. not, not like, but you know, it feels like a lot's going on all the time. And, you know, I mean, when he wakes up in his like new apartment and there's like the triple windows thing, it's like the way it's framed and you see the outside, then you see uh, cash and, uh, really cool it's just really really cool and it's really like aesthetically pleasing like i thought the movie was so engaging because of the dialogue obviously and mm-hmm. uh what's actually happening in the plot but also it's just really fun to watch you know it's just like the the street corner scenes the bar mm-hmm. scenes anything it's just it's all it's all like fucking beautiful you know yeah yeah absolutely um it, it's beautifully shot i also thought i mean how how ambitious of him to also do the soundtrack for this with with his mm-hmm. band um, which I thought fit the movie perfectly. Um, who who was your biggest scene stealer for this movie? Which I felt like there were a couple for me, but I want to see what, what stood out to you. Yeah, I mean, well, he's saying he feels excellent as Cash's screen. Mm-hmm. He's the lead, obviously, and shout out to him. He didn't get an Emmy yeah. nomination for Darius from Atlanta, but this is his first true role. A lot of people probably first became aware of him from Get Out, but again, that's mm-hmm. a small part for him. And so I'm really happy that he got this look and he does a lot, a lot of work with this because his character does grow and does change throughout the film. And, you know, I think he does awesome, but he's also kind of the, the plot mover. So it's tough for him to be the scene stealer. Right. Um, Tessa's great. Really yep. great. He's great in everything. Selma, Dear White People, Creed, Westworld, Thor 3, Annihilation. Now sorry to bother you. He's on a great run. And I just like, I just like watching her act, you know? Yeah. Um, pre two later this year, same thing. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, the probably the scene stealer for me is when uh, David Cross speaks. The white voice comes out mm-hmm. really for the first time, and and then like obviously it's spoiled by the trailer. But, like when you right. see that, like the movie just totally like turns it up to eleven at that point on. <laughs> once the path to being a power caller happens, oh my god! And then I'm just like, fuck, dude, this is this rules, you yeah. know? <laughs> yeah, and and the way the way he shoots it too, I mean the way it drops cash into the person's home and you see yeah. them like kind of interacting, but kind of Great not interacting. Idea. Great so, idea. So clever seeing them like, like celebrating, you know, him with his like manager or whatever it was like, and he, they would be like jumping around dancing. Like at one point he's like holding him as he's like celebrating just like amazing. And the way it kind of takes off from there is great. And not only with, you know, Cash's development, but the conflict uh, and kind of what the whole movie was trying to say in general, I thought it was great. You know who really stole a lot of scenes for me was uh, Kate Berlant. She played Diana Debauchery. Or it's De- De- oh, yeah. De- Boucher, De- I think she. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. De Boucher. Yeah. De Boucher. <laughs> um, but like when she was talking, that whole like staff meeting yep. was freaking hilarious. Like everybody in that scene. Oh, was yeah. Great. With the tattoos. Yeah. Um, the murder. I wasn't sure that. Yeah, did he have tattoos the whole time? Because I didn't notice him in his first appearance. And then I saw them. I was like, "Oh, did those like? Did he have get tattoos for the next scene?" I don't yeah, know. Something I, really I wasn't it. really paying attention to. I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll keep either. looking for that. But yeah, um, he, uh, all those uh, people were uh, yeah. were fun. He, um, it, it, his first interview scene, which is like, yeah. the first scene in the movie. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I thought. I mean, yeah, that yeah, was great was really too. Great. But uh, Kate Berlin also in the elevator, like just the way that yep. she's like basically like trying to show like uh cash that she's sexually attracted to him but like very like subtly and then the elevator which yeah, first of all shout out rape. rosario dawson like being the voice for that what but so freaking <laughs> funny um yeah and then omari hardwick too i thought was uh was really great especially when he finally stops talking in the white voice i like thought that yes, was pretty effective. That was a great moment really yeah. earned definitely um yeah, well, what other scenes stood out to you? What else did you really like about the movie? I think my favorite scene is the rap scene at Army Hammer's mm-hmm. house because, like, you're watching the movie and like you get like the social, the social uh, message, you know, social comedy satirizing uh, capitalism in the workplace yeah. and whatnot, and, you know, talking to your boss, all that stuff. That, that's that's pretty present because it, you know, go, you know, is there the whole time. Mm-hmm. And then 
Detroit's performance thing has you know a different angle, and you get that. And then the rap scene, you don't really you don't really see that another another message, another proclamation is coming until like right before it happens. Mm-hmm. And it's like oh, it starts out it's like oh, it's like this is like a Paul and like a you know like like dance for me, you know, like black minstrel shit, right? Mm-hmm. And it's like okay, I see that. And then he brings in the rap music. And I'm like, I, and I'm watching him struggle, and I'm like, ah, oh, just like say Gucci Gang. And soon <laughs> enough, you know, he goes into the thing, and I'm like, wow, that's equal parts a comedy on uh, poor songwriting in a contemporary mm-hmm. rap music. And then when the white people say it back to him, I'm like, oh, and that's also like the uh, takeover of rap by white people in the mainstream. Yeah. It's like, wow, there's so much here, mm-hmm. you know. And it's also entertaining watching Lakeith uh, do the scene. Yeah, so, and, that I really. Mean, uh, brought it home for me yeah that was i mean there there was a lot in that scene and just that like i said the whole party scene in general was like overwrought with metaphor <laughs> you know in, in a lot of ways i i thought a, a scene that um i really liked a lot was uh when he was going to talk with steve loft about you know the proposition to become like the next martin luther king of the equi sapiens yep. and just like you know like all the different colored doors uh, the whole like back and forth conversation. It's not Jade, it's Olive. Yeah, I know that that was just hilarious in general. But it was just like in the way that they shot it, and you kind of start to see Steve Loft really coming. I mean, you already saw him as a douchebag when he like first approached him, and it was like, you know, like oh, you can't use your like real voice here. And then he's like, oh, I'm just kidding with you. Um, I thought that was a really amazing scene. Um, also, I-, I like how they they made a commentary on like. TV shows and how like pop culture in in what we right. take today really uh, plays yeah. impact. There's so much to really break down. And, um, and w- once Cash uh, like spills the beans on the Equus yeah. Indians thing, right with the proof from the video, mm-hmm. what happens? Like he just raises the profile and the stocks go up. I'm like, oh wow, that's another thing where like you know bad publicity is good publicity and mm-hmm. uh, popularity. To, usually just helps you know yeah uh, there, there's so many so many little threads sometimes they're just acknowledged or shown to you and other times they're really uh move move through with you know is really impressive and i mean the whole third act with equo sapiens thing i know uh boots riley was saying that some people he would share the script with because again he wrote the script a while ago uh they'd be like oh no, that's too far oh yeah. now you lost me you know but again, to his credit, his first movie, he stuck to his guns and he was able to get this full movie made. And I don't know about you, but like when I first saw like that fucking massive horse schlong on top of the <laughs> horse, I was like, oh, wow. Now, now we're in this shit. Like now we're here. And I didn't think we could get even any more absurd because that was our, that was like act three, you know, but it, it went for it. Seeing the, the look Army Hammer had when he said, you get a horse cock was maybe mm-hmm. like one of my favorite moments of the year. Cause you could just tell how like excited he was to like deliver that line. It's pretty crazy. Um, yeah. The, the equi sapien thing is definitely interesting. I think people are going to take it different ways, but I thought it, I thought it made and kind of hammered home a lot of the points he was, you know, trying to, to touch yeah. on throughout. So I, I have no problem with it. Um, what did you think about the relationship between cash and, and Detroit, but then Detroit and squeeze and how that wasn't even really, touched upon by the end that was something that kind of stood out to me as i wasn't so sure about yeah i i really liked how their their relationship progressed and then uh i guess ended uh, Mm -hmm. as the movie went on just because they both felt like fleshed out characters with real personalities Mm -hmm. and they didn't have like a traditional like nuclear relationship per se even though he called her his fiance Mm -hmm. um but yeah that's a good point they do kind of just reconcile due to crisis i suppose right. um interesting point I, I would like to rewatch the end because i think at that point i'm just watching it it's just so much in your face shit mm-hmm. by that point that yeah it's a good good point like, how does that relationship really end you know how does it how does it stand up as the movie concludes good point yeah, yeah that, that was something that stood out to me i also um i also really liked and this is i we kind of overlooked him but jermaine fowler as sal in the movie was hilarious. I thought like, I thought especially when they would be like out and like uh, talking amongst the friends, he always stood out to me as like, he's stealing a lot of these scenes. And then that scene where Cassius decides to go to work and cause he's a power caller now. And they have that 
argument or they're just one upping them each other with the compliments, mm-hmm. right? Uh, I was like, that's hilarious. Yeah. yeah, that guy. I mean, the whole cast is full of charismatic performers, and he, even uh, Danny Glover. Not in there a whole lot, but you know, when he's like, "Hey, young blood," you know, yeah. it just goes from there. So good. Yeah, hell yeah. <laughs> it's actually funny when you mention the like. I hope you have a nice day off. Like you see on Twitter a lot. Like you know, the I want to be like you. Like oh, mm-hmm. a lot of people have now. Um, I mean, there, there's so much here, and I feel like we could really talk about and dissect the movie for a long time. But I mean, this made 4.3 million uh, world uh, worldwide first first weekend or first large mm-hmm. opening weekend. So uh, I hope this continues to make money, and and I hope Boots Riley gets a bigger budget for his his next project. I know he definitely wants to make more. Um, any last thoughts on just this movie in general? See it for sure. Oh yeah, absolutely see it. Um... No, I mean these are these are the movies that you know you hope don't go away mm-hmm. due to the uh, event eventization of uh, the audience. You know, right. the majority of eighty percent of film film goers go twice a year to the two biggest movies of the year, and that's it. Mm-hmm. You know, and you hope that movies like this don't fall by the wayside. And what's really happening is that movies like this aren't going away per se; they're just costing less, so right. they have a lower bar of success like Blumhouse model so uh, but yeah you, when these movies are good and everyone tells you it's good and all the audiences like it too uh, you gotta support these films so please Definitely. go see this movie I've been telling people about it like I think it's actually coming out at a great time mm-hmm. uh, especially with a skyscraper uh, underperforming for The Rock you know <laughs> so uh, after you saw Ant-Man waiting for something gonna talk about 8th grade next week but mm-hmm. uh, in the meantime see Sorry to Bother You yeah Definitely see sorry to bother you. Um, I just hope these movies also keep getting a lot of big name actors to be in them. You know, like you look last year, you had Daniel Kaluuya who really broke out with Get Out, but he had, he was establishing himself. And you also had uh, Allison Williams. But in that movie, I mean, who else is big name? No one really. So I think this is a step in the right direction for these kind of size movies that more uh, bigger name people want to be making them. Um, we're going to wrap up there for the week. Let's uh let's talk about what we're gonna be talking about next week. We have eighth grade. We have the internet. Um, uh, you'll finally get to a record you've been uh, cooking, slow cooking in the oven. Snail mail, lush. Ah, uh, yeah. I mean, it's it's fully baked at this point. It's just drying on the, the <laughs> or cooling on the heating rack. Um, we'll be talking about that. Maybe the uh, the dirty projectors or the Def Haven album as well. If we need uh, something else to get sure. to. Yep. There's there's a few other smaller albums there. Uh, Mac Miller announced a new album coming out the same day as YG's Stay Dangerous, August 3rd. Mm. So excited for that down the pipe. More excited for that YG album. Way Fuck more yeah. excited. <laughs> um, yeah, but I, I, Secession is also going to be coming to an end pretty soon, right? To, what, 10 episodes? Yeah, so or top of seven. August, we'll get yeah. to a full season review. Uh, uh, in short, we both like the show. Yeah, the it's awesome. Definitely catch up on that so you can uh, listen along with us. Um, but yeah, anything else you want to talk about? Hit us up at Nostalgia Pod. Hit Dave up at Martin Swagger and myself at Shiny World Peace. Uh, Dave also did a podcast with his friend Jono Peck uh, talking about NBA basketball. Um, it's really great. Give it a listen. Also, uh, give Dave and Jono a follow um, for any NBA insight you might want to have. Um, and yeah, give us a rating review on iTunes and uh, follow us on, on YouTube. It really helps. Uh, but until, until we meet again, peace out. Stick to the script.